It's scary to deploy new code to the cloud. There's so many things that can go wrong. Let's see how we can make your deployments safer by bringing some SRE thinking to them. Steve, uh, you told me the other day that you have experience in reliability engineering. Yeah, I was a site reliability engineer, or SRE, inside of Google for over a decade. I worked on search, Android, YouTube, and cloud. Now my job is helping developers understand how to build reliable systems on the cloud. I see. And you said that we could make deployments safer by applying SRE thinking to them. Uh, tell me more about that. Sure. Well, there are four deployment practices that I have seen work really well when I worked in SRE. We use them at Google, but anyone can adopt them and make their deployments safer. They are CICD, fast rollbacks, canary releases, and hidden feature rollouts using experiments. All right, uh, let's talk about each one. Uh, CICD is the first one in your list. That's right. First, you should set up CICD. If you're currently deploying your code manually, automate that process. It will make your deployments more reliable and repeatable. And CICD stands for continuous integration and continuous deployment? That's right. Continuous integration means that newly submitted code is automatically built or compiled and then tested. That helps uncover bugs sooner. Right. Uh, I've noticed sometimes that people forget about that testing aspect when they talk about CICD. And I might have been guilty of that myself. Uh, sometimes we only talk about the automatic deployments. Yeah, the testing part is important. Uh, your test should cover most of your application and they should run automatically whenever developers submit new code. And they should let you know when they break. Yeah, and it takes real effort to build a test suite that covers your application well. It does, but it's a good investment. So that was CI, continuous integration. CD stands for continuous delivery. That means that newly submitted code which passes CI can be deployed automatically. That way we can get it off of your laptop and into the cloud sooner. Ah, uh, but what if I don't want to automatically deploy new code? Uh, it sounds kind of risky. Well, you can deploy it automatically to a test environment. That way the latest version of the system will always be available for testing. When it comes to deploying your production environment, there are many options. Your system might be built automatically, but an operator would still make the choice whether or not to deploy. If so, the deployment would then proceed through an automated pipeline, for example, pushing the code to each region or zone in some predefined order, including production tests along the way. If you want to go a step further and automatically deploy into production every time, that is called continuous deployment. It's another CD. This might sound scary, but actually, more frequent deployments make each one safer. Each one is smaller and can be identified and fixed with more precision. So what if you take that to its logical conclusion? Uh, should we deploy every hour, uh, every minute? I like where you're going, but be careful. Uh, for example, it's not a good way to launch a new product. Sometimes you want control on exactly when something is revealed to customers. Also, if you have many system components changing at different frequencies, this can be very confusing, making troubleshooting even harder if something goes wrong. So you may want to simplify your deployments, like make them at 1 p.m. every day. Over time, you can become better at this, and you can increase that frequency in a controlled manner. Hmm. And uh, what if there are some steps that are really hard to automate? Even if deployment to production is not fully automated, you can still make it semi-automated or scripted. That reduces the scope for mistakes uh, your deployments shouldn't require people to do complex things perfectly every time. Automate away the complexity. And the serverless products within Google Cloud uh, support the CI CD? Yes, they do. Many customers use Cloud Build and Cloud Deploy or GitHub Actions to automatically test and deploy new code. If you're using Cloud Run, you can take advantage of its point and click integration with GitHub. All right. If I want more reliable uh, deployments, first I need to add CI CD. So let's say I have done that. I have that all set up. Uh, what comes next? So once you have CI CD, you should enable fast rollbacks. And rollbacks mean reverting to the previous version of your system? That's right. 
Uh, but Steve, if I deploy a new version of my system and there's a bug, isn't it better to actually fix that bug uh, to keep rolling forward as it were? That sounds like it should be true, but usually it isn't. It can be quite stressful to investigate a bug and come up with a fix. Even worse is trying to do that while the system is broken. Imagine that customers are complaining or there's a chance that data is getting corrupted. So if you create a bug fix while you're stressed out like that, can you be sure you won't also introduce yet another bug? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So it's better to roll back instead? Yeah, because it buys you time. If you roll back to a version that you know worked, you can now investigate the bug and fix it at your leisure. No one is yelling at anyone, nobody's hair is on fire. And your list specifically says fast rollbacks. Yeah, well, we want it to be fast every time because we know that the system is broken and we want to minimize the time that it is in a broken state. Sometimes you hear about terms like MTTR, mean time to recover, which relates to this. You also want to make sure that your rollback is reliable. That is, that you know it will succeed in one shot. That way, you're not afraid of rolling back. When you feel confident in rolling back, you will do it more often. In other words, you'll buy time for the development team more often. You'll reduce the number of times they have to fix bugs under pressure. It does mean that you need to put in the extra work to make sure that rollbacks are fast and reliable. All right, very good. Uh, the next item on your list uh, was Canary releases. Uh, how do they work? That's right. The idea is that you expose your new changes to a subset of your users first, instead of changing everything all at once. This is generically called gradual change, and it is a core principle of SRE. If the new changes work well, you can roll out the change further. If your changes have any bugs, you can roll them back before the entire, entire system experiences problems. And how would we do that? There are several ways of doing this. Essentially, we need to decide how to split our users across current and new versions of our app. Sometimes we call these assignments cohorts, and you can make this as complex as you'd like. You can simply randomly assign users to versions based on load balancer assignment. This is very simple, but it has some drawbacks. Uh, but that means that a user might get the regular interface one time, and then the canary release if they click or reload. Uh, for example, the toolbar might change as the user is clicking through the application. Uh, that would be distracting, right? That's right. Good catch. Uh, so to combat that, you could keep users on the version they're currently on and only send new visitors to the new version. That way, users get a consistent experience. Either way, we start by assigning a small set of users, say 1%, to a cohort that sees the new version, and we grow that set slowly and in a controlled manner. If there's a problem, we use the fast rollbacks we already discussed. Uh, that sounds like additional work. Uh, why would you do all this? Well, the beauty of this is that it makes your system appear more stable than it really is. Let's say that the new version of your system has a bug. If you release the Canary version to 1% of your users, any given user will only run a 1% chance of experiencing that bug. If you didn't use Canary releases, 100% of users would see the bug. In other words, with Canary releases, your system will appear 100 times more stable to users than it really is. Who wouldn't want that? Oh, I would want that. <laughs> but st it still sounds kind of complicated. Uh, how do we keep these releases straight? Well, we really only need our CI-CD automation to keep track of three versions at any time. You should start with three simple tags, previous, current, and next. We keep previous in case we need to roll back. Current is the version that serves most of our users, and next is our Canary version. When there's a new release, current becomes previous, next becomes current, and the new release becomes next. If we're using Artifact Registry in Google Cloud, we can add these tags on versions of our containers. And how would I set this up in Cloud Run? Ah, so if you're using Cloud Run and you just want to do the simple randomized Canary method, you just use the traffic splitting feature to implement this. To start out, you set the traffic percent to 99% for current and 1% for next. If you want the consistent user interface, like in the toolbar example, you'd enable session affinity to stick users on a single version at a time. And what if my QA team wants to see the new version? Uh, do we have to wait for them to be randomly assigned to this 1% Canary release? Yeah, no way. Uh, in Cloud Run, new versions have their own URL which you can directly share with whomever you want to see the new version without having to hope to be chosen to see the Canary version. So how long do I have to run my 1% Canary for? Ah, 
It depends on your application, of course, but a simple answer is to let the canary bake at 1% for a couple hours, then progress to something like 10%. Let it bake longer, then 50%, then 100, or whatever makes sense to you. Basically, you want time to detect and react to any failure as you grow this exposure. If you're being very careful, you might want to consider a full day to take in any sort of daily traffic cycles, for example, peak usage in the afternoon or running reports at midnight. You want to catch those bugs too. Okay, so this might mean that a release takes many hours or, or maybe even days. Uh, what if I want to release faster than that? Correct. In systems that really need stability, SREs are known to keep canarying for up to a week. In these cases, we don't want to sacrifice velocity, so we do something called pipelined canarying, where the next version can start canarying while the previous one hasn't finished yet. This gets a bit more confusing and you need more than three tags, but we can leave this as an exercise for the viewers. Hmm, I see. So I can release several uh, different features quickly while still having the ability to roll back. Uh, but it seems like they're still uh, they're deployed in order based on how they were committed to source control, right? Uh, what if I have multiple teams working on new features and I don't want to have them wait on each other? Right. That's where experiments come in. Ah, uh, right. That was next on your list. What are experiments? They're similar to canary releases, but they give you more speed and precision. Let's say your team is working on the new image format, the new login page, and the new toolbar uh, that we mentioned earlier. If you release all three using a canary release and there's a problem, it may be hard to figure out which of these three features caused it. Should we put the three features in three canary releases, released one after another? We could do that, but as we said, it would take time if we serialized all these new features like that. So if you deliver a few large changes, it may feel safer, but over the last decade or two, we've learned that it's really not. Again, more frequent and smaller changes are safer. But it wouldn't be very safe to just push every code commit to the production environment. That's right. We need speed and precision. Let's say your team is working on these three new features. You can separate the deployment of your code from the exposure of that code to your users. That is, you can have hidden code that your users never really see. This is helpful because you can introduce partially finished code and know that it won't confuse customers, but it allows you to ensure there aren't any subtle failure modes, say introducing a null pointer exception or other crashing behavior. We call this an invisible change. Okay, so we deploy these three new features we talked about, but we're not, they're not active, they're not visible yet. But at some point we want to expose them to users. Uh, how we do we do that? That's right. Now we'd switch modes from an invisible deployment to an expected change type of deployment. For example, we may decide to show the new toolbar because we've now validated it works better than the old one, it's bug-free in production. Even though we pushed the code many releases ago, we can choose now to activate or expose this feature. And then uh, would all users see the new toolbar? Well, we can have these predetermined user cohorts, just like in Canarying. These would be based on the strong identity, like your Google login or some other mechanism, maybe using cookies. Uh, we would define what we call an experiment, which would result in exposing this change to this cohort. So initially we can expose this feature to a small subset of users without having to wait for a release to go out. Just like with Canarying, we are then able to ramp up enrollment over time. And as always, we would measure success or failure and roll back if needed as early as possible. And what would that give us? Well, this method can help you find things like emergent cross-feature bugs. For example, what if the new toolbar we're launching happens to overlap with the purchase button in our app? We might not have thought of this to test, and we only really know about it when it hits production and we notice sales dropping. By using an experiment, we can catch this very early with a cohort of possibly even a single test user. This cohort could be QA testing or a business analyst. In order to mitigate this problem, we would just have to disable this experiment. We don't have to roll back any code. It's super fast. So these experiments are kind of like the next level of canary deployments? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. We would measure errors and successes for each cohort. If there are errors, we fix them. If there aren't, we gradually enroll more, more and more cohorts into this experiment. Eventually, everyone would be in a cohort where they are seeing this new feature. Then we'd make that feature permanent in our product. Okay, uh, how would you implement these experiments and turning them on and off? 
Well, this is actually pretty cutting edge stuff. One option would be to build your own. Or there are a few vendors which provide mechanisms for this. Essentially, you need some administrative tools like an experiment management dashboard, experiment enablement mechanisms, as well as a library for wrapping your code to enable and disable these. Right, it feels a lot safer to flip a bit in a database than to deploy brand new code to the cloud. Totally, it can also be used to be far more precise in launching features or products at a certain time, like at a keynote event or during a live broadcast. Be careful though of the thundering herd effect. Make sure you have capacity in place. Ah, very good. Great discussion, Steve. Uh, let's recap how we can make deployments safer using SRE thinking. Sure. So CICD is the first way to automate your previously manual release process. Get those tests running and push on a schedule. Fast rollbacks are a great capability or a generic mitigation for teams to react to almost any incident involving bad code pushes or configurations. Canary releases makes your code look 100 times better than it really is. Who wouldn't want that? And finally, experiments are an advanced capability, giving teams more speed and precision in their release process. I like that you ordered these items for us, Steve. Uh, now, I myself, I can't do all of them right now, but I know where to start. That's right. They're in priority order for a reason. Uh, that means you can choose not to implement all the items. Maybe you feel that an experiment framework won't bring a lot of value to your application, at least not now. So start at the top of your list and work your way down until you feel good about your deployments and you're meeting your SLOs. <laughs> That's a great point. Uh, thanks for joining me today, Steve. Thanks for having me, Martin. And thank you, everyone, for watching. If you have any questions for Steve or me, please let us know in the comments. Also, do let me know if there are any other serverless topics you'd like to see in future episodes. I read every single comment. Until next time.